Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar on building mental health resilience in our children. Please start the pre-survey before we begin. We will be beginning shortly. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Meir Goldstein. I am a pre-med student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Before we begin, if everyone can please start the pre-survey um, and filling out the pre-survey, we'll enter you into a raffle for a chance to win a $50 Amazon gift card. We'll be beginning shortly. Welcome everyone. Hi everyone, please fill out the pre-survey before we begin. We'll be beginning shortly. Hi everyone, thank you for joining our webinar on raising a resilient teen. Before we get started, please fill out the pre-survey. My name is Meir Goldstein and I am a pre-med student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I wanna thank everyone for being here. And I would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Novick and soon to be Dr. Carly Namdar. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Rona Novick. Dr. Rona Novick, PhD, is a licensed clinical psychologist the Dean of Israeli Graduate School of Jewish Education and Administration for Yeshiva University holds the Rain and Stanley Silverson Chair 
in professional ethics and values and serves as a co-educational director of the Hidden Sparks program, which provides professional development to day schools and yeshivas. Along with scholarly publications on bullying and trauma, special education, Jewish education, parenting, positive psychology, and social emotional learning, she is the author of Helping Your Child Make Friends and editor of the series, Kids Don't Come with Instruction Manuals. Her children's book, Mommy, Can You Stop the Rain, was published by Apples and Honey Press in 2020 and is available on Amazon.com. Her second children's book will be published in 2022. Dr. Novick, a frequent presenter to professionals and families, is internationally recognized for her expertise in human growth and development, social emotional learning, bully prevention, spirituality, positive psychology, trauma, cognitive behavioral interventions, diverse learners, and family dynamics. Dr. Novick greatly enjoys supporting educators, families, and all who help children grow into strong, capable, caring individuals. Next, I would like to introduce Carly Namzar. Carly Namdar is an educational psychologist and has just completed her doctoral dissertation at the Israeli Graduate School of Jewish Education and Administration on the mental health impact of the pandemic on Jewish day school students and predictors of resilience, well being, and post traumatic growth. Carly was awarded the Robert M. Sherman Young Pioneer Award for the Jewish Education Project in 2020 for her work in the field of social emotional learning. Carly is passionate about bridging moral and character education and positive psychology to introduce students, families, and faculty to ideas related to cultivating character strengths, building resilience, and breaking down stigma associated with mental health. In her work in the Jewish educational community as an educational psychologist for the last 12 years, Carly has worked towards fostering a school environment that promotes resilience, inclusion, and social cohesion as students build the skills and agency to, to navigate their ever-changing world. Carly has extensive experience delivering and coordinating social emotional learning, professional development, and implementing counseling and interventions to address students' social, emotional, and academic needs. Carly was also a psychologist at OL's Camp Keeley, an inclusive camp experience for campers of all abilities, where she provided training and social emotional support to staff and campers. Carly has recently joined the national trauma team at OL's Children's Family and Home and Family Services as Trauma Sensitive Services Coordinator. A native of Melbourne, Australia, Carly now resides in New York with her husband and four children. To start off, the first question we will address is how do you define resilience as it pertains to mental health? Dr. Novick, if you can please get us started. Sure. First of all, good evening, everyone. And it's well wonderful to see so many people have joined us. Um, it's interesting that in the mental health field, there's actually some um, disagreement about how we define resilience. Some people think of resilience as bouncing back from trauma or stress. Others have said resilience is really about not bouncing back, but bouncing forward, about moving ahead after trauma. And still others say it's unfair to expect that people ex is experiencing trauma or stress have to not only regroup and be able to continue as they were, but actually have to grow and advance. And, and maybe resilience is the ability to just handle and manage and adapt in the face of life's stresses, whether they're intense and continuous stressors or whether they're sudden and traumatic stressors. Hi, thank you. Um, thank, Dr. Novick, you exactly what I was thinking. Um, I think res I see resilience in the work that I've been doing as, as really something that's very dynamic. Um, and it's a developmental process of adapting well, um, despite of or in spite of or because of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or, you know, everyday stressors that we're facing. Um, I think if you look at the literature, like Dr. Novick said, it's really a lot about an ability to withstand and cope with stress that um, facilitates thriving despite or in spite of adversity. Um, and I think there's the element of the positive adaptation and there's also the element of handling adversity. Um, and if you look at, you know, having just completed my dissertation study, one of the factors that I looked at was resilience. Um, there's a lot of talk about not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward and taking whatever you have experienced, integrating it within who you are as a person and moving forward with that. 
I would just like to add that it's quite remarkable that we are here, psychologists and educators talking about resilience because 25, 30 years ago, psychology, and, and you asked the question, Mayura, about how does this um, dovetail with mental health? 25 or 30 years ago, we really weren't talking about mental health. We were talking about mental illness. And we focused on what's called the deficit model. Psychologists studied and worked with people who had trouble, who weren't thriving, who weren't surviving, and who weren't adapting. And about 30 years ago, about three decades ago, a group of psychologists put their heads together and said, you know, it's very intriguing, but we can go into horrific environments, slums, where teenagers are living with single parent families below the poverty level, the worst schools in the country, incredible substance use all around them. And we find a handful of those teenagers who despite all that are doing really well. Instead of studying the mentally ill, why don't we study them? And that was really gave birth to the field of positive psychology where we unearthed not only the concept of resilience, that there are people who seem to have the life skills and the tools to manage through adversity, but it also began the study and the exploration of what tools and skills can we build in our children and our teens to allow them to have resilience and mental wellness. And even though they don't have mental illness, this is a this is a preventative measure that we can offer. Thank you, Dr. Novick. In regard to that, the next question is, what are some factors of a home environment that are associated with the development of resilience in children and teens? And what are some factors of the school environment associated with resilience? Carly, why don't you go first for this one? Sure. Um, I think, you know, in my work, I like to see, I, I think we have the best outcomes for children and teens when home and school are aligned. So I think that a lot of what we could say we would do as parents is really important for us to consider in, the, in how we're educating children as well. I think that first and foremost, providing children with a safe, secure and stable environment and trustworthy adults is really, really important. The power of our connections with others, the power of us having a champion who's going to believe in us, who's going to be that supportive adult for us is really important, as well as the internal, the intrapersonal qualities that we want to, you know, help nurture and build within our students or our children, you know, being able to help them identify and regulate their own emotions is really, really important. Uh, we have, when we're struggling, you know, we hear a lot about the, um, the, I just slipped my mind, the freeze, um, you know, the, the, the I just forgot the, the words, the freeze response, right? But then there's also this instinct of um, tend and befriend. You know, when we're struggling that we want to reach out to an adult, we want to have someone that we can reach out to, to help us. Um, I think that there's, there's, a, there's an approach that speaks of the seven C's of resilience, but that when we wanna instill resilience in children. We speak about the idea of giving kids a sense of control, giving children the chance to, and the opportunity to be able to make choices on their own. If you think of it as, you know, teaching a child how to fish, giving them a fishing rod instead of handing them the fish itself. So there's this, the idea of giving children a sense of control, helping children to develop a sense of competence, a sense that they on their own are able to achieve things and really help them explore what are their strengths, what are their talents, so that they can begin to show some independence. Uh, really look to teach children about how to cope and respect what their coping style is. So we can do this as parents, we can also do this as educators. And I think that, that there's a big push for social emotional learning today and to embed that kind of learning within all the teaching that we do because we're going to build resilient teens and resilient children when they learn that coping 
is part of everything that we do. Um, you know, we want to instill with them also a, a sense of confidence. Uh, a, Connections are really, really important. We want to make sure that they have people that they are connected to. So um, there's a big push now in schools also for the adults and obviously for the parents that are bringing up these children to ensure that children socially are connected to other children and children in school are connected to at least one adult. We want to really look out for the kids in our schools and really make sure that we have children connected to peers and connected to other adults as well. And we wanna help them build their character. We wanna help them identify what are their unique strengths? How can they contribute to the school environment, to the family, to the home environment using those strengths? And I think that that's really gonna help them build a sense of identity and build a sense of resilience as well. I would just add that I think that there's the work that we do at schools and in our homes in general, and then there's what we need to do when the world goes crazy. And in the past two years, the world has gone crazy, and there is not a sign that we've, you know, we, we've, if we've left the frying pan, it's just to get into the fire. Um, we've, we've, you know, swapped out maybe, you know, one set of worries and anxieties for another. I think that what Carly said is so important about our love of our children, our relationship with them and our connection with them. Having adults in your life, having a caring adult who is a constant is so important. And later maybe we'll talk about some other specific things, but when the world is so unpredictable, I think the things both schools and home need to do is first and foremost to help teens know that whatever it is they're feeling, they're not crazy. It's a normal response to a totally abnormal situation. But adolescents live in their minds and they are scared if they're not sleeping, if their appetite is impacted, if they're feeling incredibly anxious, they may not be reading the New York Times articles that says the levels of anxiety and depression are off the charts in teens these days they think there's something wrong with them. And so one of the first things we can do in our schools and in our homes is say, you know, you may be feeling a little bit off and not your best self. That's okay. We're all on edge. We're all feeling like that. The second thing we can do is to help our teenagers focus in a world that is so unpredictable on what can be predicted and what has not changed. In all of the months of working at home, I visit a particular tree in my backyard because it's a stalwart, it grows no matter what, it grows. It's green all year round and I can go out and look at it and I can depend on it when the rest of the world has become totally um, random appearing. And the last thing I think that's our job and it's what, it's what I wrote the book for. I, I know this is not, this is my little advertisement here. That's what mommy, can you stop the rain looks like. Um, it's not written for teenagers, but the message is true for all ages. And that's that parents and adults, teachers are agents of reassurance. It's so hard when we ourselves don't feel reassured. Can we tell our teenagers they're smart? We can't say, don't worry about COVID. It's all going to be fine. We can't provide that reassurance. But we can provide reassurance that says, we're in this together. I'm here with you. We're going to work through this. Whatever you need, I'm going to make sure you get it. I'm, I'm your mom. I'm your dad. I'm your teacher. That's my job. And I'm going to be here through the hard times. You don't have to do this alone. That's the reassurance that teens need um, at these times. And, you know, I think we call that companioning a child. Right. Yeah. I think that as we are going through whatever we're going through, being the person that helps to narrate what the child is experiencing is is incredibly powerful. And, you know, children can offer it's a, children of different ages, you know, differ along this spectrum. But children can be really great observers, but sometimes they can be really poor interpreters and being an attentive parent really helps 
you build the narrative with your child, you know, watching the news with your child, helping to see what they do understand about a particular situation and then discussing things through with them and validating, like Dr. Novik said, is, is incredibly important. On that note, what are other practical interventions that can be made in school to promote resilience? Dr. Novik, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, th these are the practical things I was going to talk about, and Carly hinted at them. Um, although one we we didn't we have not really talked about, um, and that's gratitude. We know that gratitude and generosity, the two G's, giving and and giving thanks. Uh, make us happier. They ameliorate stress. That's why we banged our pots and pans in the New York area at eight o'clock every night. I think it was eight o'clock. I don't remember. Maybe seven o'clock. Okay. It's why it's why the the signs in my neighborhood the signs went up. Thank you, healthcare workers, and why in windows there were all kinds of of thank yous to postmen and and to um, essential workers in the early days of the, of the pandemic. Gratitude and generosity, we think about it as helping someone else, but it turns out that they fuel us. They make us feel better. Um, there's an amazing story when Katrina hit. The teens, there, everyone, uh, many people in, in New Orleans were relocated to the, to the, it's Astrodome is New Orleans, the Astrodome. And, uh, the mental health professionals, there were not enough of them to deal with everybody's trauma. They noticed that the teenagers were not doing well, but they didn't have enough psychologists and social workers to work with the teens. So that's my next point. What did they do? They didn't give them counseling. They gave them work. They said the elderly people can't do all the steps to get water and food. You are going to be the water delivery brigade. And they organized the teenagers into squads to bring water to the elderly. It eliminated the teenager's depression. Having meaning and purpose in a difficult time and in life in general is also stress reducing. And so what schools can do is harness. Teenagers are unbelievably effective as agents of change. You know, if you give them a hammer and some nails, they'll build something. If you ask them to raise money for a cause, they will do it. Collect clothes for the children in the Ukraine. They will, they'll be on it. It not only helps the world, it helps the teenagers as well because it takes this crazy world that we're living in and says, but, but I got through the pandemic by doing something meaningful. I contributed in some useful way. And that's really good for teenagers growth. If I could just add to that, um, I, I think, um, you know, we, we, there's a lot that we could talk about in terms of building a resilience toolbox uh, for children. I, I know from my research in my dissertation, one of the things that I looked at was the power of hope and the power of spirituality as buffers, uh, as protective factors for uh, well-being um, and for protective factors of resilience, post-traumatic growth and life satisfaction. And the results were, were pretty incredible. Um, when we give adolescents, I mean, it, my study was done on middle school students, but when, we, when they had greater hope, it really led to enhanced levels of resilience, post-traumatic growth, life satisfaction, and um, psychological well-being. And when we talk about hope, we, we talk about a agency, a sense of being able to set goals, being able to set, to have ideas that whatever I do, I will be able to find a pathway to be able to exercise the goal that I have and what I can do and the impact that I can have is meaningful. Just like, you know, the power of spirituality, especially within the Jewish community, there's a lot of research that talks about how having that belief in you know something that is bigger and stronger than me and you know putting your faith 
subsuming in, into something else, it really does go a long way to boost resilience and to boost well-being and, and post-traumatic growth. There's a lot of research if you look at, you know, after um, different hurricanes and after 9-11, Dr. Novick was talking before about the growth of positive psychology, but there's a character strengths assessment that you can do to look at, uh, at your individual character strengths. And the results of that survey pre and post 9-11 showed a real elevation in strengths like hope and in strengths um, spirituality and gratitude. So these transcendence character strengths really do go a long way to boost resilience and to boost these positive outcomes, especially despite difficulties. I think one of the challenges with Jewish teens and spirituality, um, it is 100% clear that it is beneficial, but we have to be comfortable with difficult questions. We have to open up our Shabbat tables for God talk, even the tough questions, like if there's, if God is all powerful, why is there COVID? And why are people getting sick? And why are people we love struggling? How, do, what, you know, we, we talk about a, a God of Rachamim, of mercy, but this doesn't seem so merciful. We have to be able to sit with our teenagers ambivalence and even sometimes their anger. And one of the wonderful things about being a parent and an educator is that you do not need to be perfect. You're human and your humanity actually matters and helps things. So that when teens ask tough spiritual questions, it's okay to say, you know, that's really a very good question. I don't have the answer and I'm struggling a little bit with that too, or I struggled with that. And I can tell you how I made sense of it. You're gonna find your pathway. But as Carly said, I'll companion with you. I'll walk with you on that path, but you're gonna find those answers. Um, let's find them together. But spirituality is really important, but not in a simplistic way. It is not okay to say to uh, teens or even younger children, well, let's, you know, if we just pray hard enough, things will get better. We, the last thing we want is for our teens or our younger children to feel that somehow the world's ills result from their not praying hard enough. They need to understand that prayer is a way we connect to God. It's a way we talk to God. It is not an ATM machine. It is not we put in our code and out comes what we ask for. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is a dialogue. And just like in any conversation, sometimes you get the answers you want, but not always. Right. Thank you. Um, I would just like to take a moment to welcome anyone who has recently joined our webinar on promoting resilience. Um, also, if anyone has any specific questions for our panelists, feel free to post them in the Q&A box. Um, moving on, I would like to ask, what specific challenges do children with learning differences face in the development of resilience? And what are some ways we can confront these challenges? Carly, would you like to begin? Sure. I think, um, you know, one of the challenges that we can face is learned helplessness when a child is really, really struggling. Um, and socially, you know, they're, the way that they might struggle in the classroom, it might impact them um, socially with their friends, you know, it depends on how they're able to comprehend information. The, the, there's a number of ways that the challenges can present in the classroom. I will say, not to sugarcoat things, but what I have seen from students over the years, the resilience that I have seen from ch uh, children that struggle with learning differences or other differences as well, it, it's just, it really reinforces the need to do everything we can to build these students up because they can tend, to, they can be the most resilient, incredible, powerful students that, you know, and so successful both inside the classroom in however we allow them to be and outside the classroom as well. I think that we have to remember that we do want to give children 
what, with whatever challenge they have, whether it's a learning difference or any other kind of difference, we do want to give them a sense of agency. So I think that as children get older, we want them to understand what their struggle is and really work very hard to help them advocate for themselves and to help them uh, learn tools to access support they need and to really uh, compensate and, and do whatever they can to help themselves. I've seen recently um, when children will go for a neuropsychological evaluation, a lot of the time the therapist at the end will spend time with the child explaining their strengths and explaining their areas of struggle. And I think that that's a really important element of the evaluation process is making sure that the child understands their learning profile and what they can do and how they can access the support they need. I think it's also really crucial for um, to really focus on building these students up, helping them find their strength, their island of competence, you know, something that they can excel at, a way that they can be helpful in the school, perhaps a way that they can show success doesn't have to be you know, through academics, you know, school is not going to last forever for everyone that comes to school. Uh, and, the, and the child's schedule and their life and everything should not revolve around the learning difference that they have. You know, we should focus on giving them opportunities to shine in other ways and really, um, really find their strengths. You know, one of the challenges is that on the one hand, you know, we, we had the Olympics a few months ago, and I, I don't know about anyone else, but I watch the Olympic ice skaters and I, I, I'm in awe and I have no sense whatsoever that I could ever do that. I don't hold myself up to that standard, but teens and children are constantly comparing themselves to their peers and they live in a world where it's not the choice that they say, well, I'm not going to be a figure skater. It's math and it's reading and it's Humash and it's Gemara and it's, you know, it's Jewish studies and it's, and they're expected to be like everyone else. And it's, it is very important that we help children learn from a very early age that there are all kinds of minds and all kinds of bodies. And some people have some talents and other people have other talents. And even within your own family, to talk about, you know, this one is a really fast runner and that one can draw beautiful um, pictures, but he, both of you can't run fast and draw pictures that each of you have your own talent. At the same time, too many uh, children with learning challenges have adopted or they've been told that there are things they can't do. Oh, I can't add, or I can't read when what we have to do is rather give them a metaphor that um, I, I always use the example, you can't tell this on, on Zoom, but I'm only five feet tall. So there are many things that I could say, I can't play basketball, I'm five feet tall. I can't reach that thing in the kitchen, I'm five feet tall. Or I could get a stool. It's harder for me to reach things in my kitchen. In order to do it, I have to get a stool. And I work 10 times as hard as someone who's five, eight or six feet in playing basketball. But I grew up with sons playing basketball with them in my backyard. And I got pretty good at some of my shots. I just work harder than other people because of my innate limitations. And that the same is true for children who have learning issues. There may be things that you have to work harder at than the person sitting next to you. And I know that feels unfair and it feels terrible, but there are things that you do very quickly and easily because that's your talent. But we have to help them shift from I can't to with the right tools, with the right help, and with a lot of effort on my part, I can try. And there are many things I will be able to do. And to me, that's also an incredibly resilient attitude. Thank you for sharing that and also touching upon a child's weaknesses and challenges and how we can promote resilience in regard to that. Um, 
Next, I would like to ask, what are some practical ways to help and promote resilience skills in a child or teen who is more sensitive or fragile? Carly, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, I think, I think I, the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of self-compassion. Just when I hear uh, hear the word fragile, that that's what I think of. I know that there's a lot of uh, podcasters and people talking about uh, HSPs, highly sensitive people right now. I don't know an, a lot about that, but I know that, look, there there is a tendency when you have a child or an, you know, a young child or an adolescent that is a little more fragile, that is a little more sensitive, that you know you want to jump in and you want to uh, you want to help them, and sometimes you you overstep, and sometimes we do too much for them because we think they're so fragile and so sensitive that down the line that may really harm them. Um, I think that we really need to think about the scaffolding that we're gonna to need to provide that child or teen with. And we may need to scaffold them with support differently than we'd scaffold another child in the family that may be a, more of a stronger or more of an independent child. But I think what we really might need to do is really build their sense of self-efficacy, right? Build their sense of their belief in being able to achieve a goal or an outcome. And they may need more support and like I said, more handholding to get to where they need to be. That's okay. We shouldn't jump in and do things for them, but we give them that support and we relinquish that support as needed. And we may have to be a little more attentive as to, you know, when we when we peel back and have them also learn to articulate when they need more support or when they feel they're more comfortable to do it on their own. Um, they may also have perhaps, you know, one of the things that's very important when we talk about resilience is self-care, right? Having your own, taking care of yourself, putting your own oxygen mask on first. So before you attend to whatever you're dealing with. So a highly sensitive child or a teen might have a stronger need for self-care than others. So I think really helping a child understand that need for self-care and what they can do to take care of that, that, that need that they might have in order to really help them uh, bounce forward. I think, um, you know, modeling and teaching them self-esteem and really tell, teaching them about um, you know, trusting in themselves is really important. Again, you may need to scaffold differently for these kinds of children, but really letting them know that they have that champion in you and hopefully you can partner with someone in school that can help give them that support too, will really help build them up and give them that sense of agency that can help them launch. The challenge with, with sensitive children is that even beginning a discussion about, I've noticed this is, you're struggling or are you struggling with is, oh, you're saying I'm a failure. Oh my, I, I, guess, I guess I'm a wreck. Um, I, I, I see, I knew there was something seriously wrong with me. Now this just proves it. So I think that along with Carly's really cogent and, and compassionate discussion of self-care, we need two other components that I would add. One is making failure an integral part of growth. Not just making it acceptable and okay, but making it an essential. You have to fail. It's one of my favorite parenting stories. I, I don't know that I would say my child was fragile, but was certainly very sensitive to criticism and was one of those children who didn't like doing things wrong. And teaching him to ride a two-wheeler without the training wheels. The first time he fell off, he threw the bike down and said, I'm stupid, I can't ride a bike, I'll never ride a bike. That's it, I'm not riding a bike. And I, I just had an epiphany, a parenting epiphany at that moment, partly out of desperation. I live in suburbia, boy, you have to ride bicycles here. You have to learn this skill. So I said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I made a terrible mistake, I forgot to tell you that when you're, right, when you're learning to ride a bike with the two wheels, the proprioceptive center of the brain needs you to fall 
multiple times so that the balance center and the proprioception center begin making neural pathways. I'm making all of this up as I go along. And I say from here to the corner, I think you, you probably have to fall about seven times in order to get that neural pathway going. Do you think you could fall seven times? And he looked at me like I was crazy and he said, you want me to fall? I said, seven times from here to the corner. He says, what if I only fall three times? I said, all right, we'll do it again. You'll, you'll come back, you'll do a few more times. But what I realized was that he needed me to make falling failure. Okay. Success, not just yeah. okay. It was a requirement. It was an essential component of the task. Too often in schools, you know, we, we put two plus two on the board and we think that the important thing to do is to write four. We forget to say it's just as important to write not three and not five. It's important to understand these are the mistakes I used to make and here's what I learned from it. And if we have sensitive children, then helping them to know that their failures are not, they're not a roadblock. They are not a, a um, off course detour. They're part of their learning and growth. That's how we grow is through those mistakes. So that's part one. Part two is before we can do self-care, we have to be self-aware. We have to become emotionally literate about this is what it feels like when I'm sad. This is how I act when I'm sad. This is not sad right now. How many, I mean, we see it much more in younger children. They stamp up the stairs and they say, I'm not angry. And we know they're angry. We can see that they're angry or they're crying. Their lip is quivering and I'm not sad. I'm really not sad. We, we know, we can see their emotions, but, but teenagers, as sophisticated as they are cognitively, emotionally, sometimes they're very confused about their feelings and learning to understand, to recognize their feelings. And then not in the moment of crisis, not when they're crying, not when they're angry and upset, but in a quiet moment to say, you know, I was wondering when you get sad, what is it that helps you feel better? What is it that you could do? What is it you'd like me to do? Could we try some things that work and engage them in a conversation, engage your teenager in a conversation about what is going to help you get past a difficulty and whatever it is they suggest say, well, look, why don't we try that? Why don't we try that next time? I don't know. You don't know if it'll work. It's our best guess. Let's be researchers together. We'll experiment. Let's try it and let's see if it works. My three-year-old grandson told me just a week ago, he has a beloved stuffed animal called Monkey and he was in the middle of a temper tantrum. And I asked him if Monkey would help him feel better. And through his stomping and hysterics, he said, Monkey helps with sad, not with mad. And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty good that he knows what to do with sad. We gotta work on what he does with mad, but he knows how to get past sad. That's what we need to give our, our teenagers to be resilient. Imagine the teenager who says, when I'm feeling down, this is the music I need to listen to, to pick me up. This is the friend I have to call to boost me when I'm in the dumps. This is the friend I stay away from when I'm angry. They're just gonna rev me up. Knowing that, you, you can do that self-care once you're, you have that awareness of what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And quite frankly, all of us as, as adults need to do this work too. We need to figure out what is it that calms us? What is it that reassures us, that boosts our mood? Um, knowing those things uh, is so helpful to get through life's ups and downs. I think, I think also, you know, uh, it, I think people are doing a lot nowadays in schools to really help children identify where they're feeling emotions in their body, right? I know Dr. Novick's book does that. I know OHEL actually has a, a wonderful resilience workbook 
that they put out during COVID and it's going to be revamped uh, for post-COVID. And there's a big emphasis on the idea of interoception, you know, where you feel different emotions in your body. And what we really need to do is really build that emotional awareness with children from a young age. So it's it's destigmatized for them to, you know, to understand where they feel, what they feel, how they feel their emotions. And the resilience, the OHEL Resilience Workbook actually links their feeling to now, what are you going to do about it? And I think that that's a really important piece. And just to make sure that that, you know, that remains destigmatized as we get older. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, how do we help a child who already sees him or herself as a failure? Dr. Novak? You know, I, I, I think we have to challenge those faulty assumptions. But it's not enough to just do it cognitively. It's not enough to just say, well, we kind of let me argue it out of it. You have to actually show the evidence so that you have to say, oh my gosh, you are, you baked that? Extraordinary, extraordinary. I could not do that. You're a really accomplished baker. And it's, it's a building a sense of the positives that and, and as I said earlier, we're so used to celebrating the A plus that gets posted on the refrigerator door or the beautiful picture that gets painted, that's hung on the walls. But there we have, we have teenagers who are the most kind hearted people you will ever meet. And we have to celebrate that. And people who are the most organized, we have to celebrate that. And, and people who are the most passionate fans of a sport or a, a musician, and we have to celebrate that, their ability to just really love something um, and, and be an avid fan of it. Th those are things we don't typically say, you're great at that. that. All of those things take effort and energy. And we have to help um, teens who think that they're a failure see things another way. Just one, one other thing that, you know, I have to say is here we are, you know, the, the, um, the Women's Medical Association and I, I want a Jewish Women's Medical Association sponsoring this tonight. One of the signs of depression is a negative worldview. And we do have to consider that if we are hearing from a teenager hopelessness, helplessness, I'm a failure. Nothing feels good anymore. The things I used to enjoy, I don't enjoy anymore. I don't wanna be with my friends because who would wanna be with me anyway? Especially if it represents a shift in an adolescent's usual way of talking, then it may be important to get a consultation with a mental health practitioner and to carefully evaluate for depression. If I could just add to that, I think I'm gonna come back to my point from before about self-compassion. I think um, sometimes we have to think to ourselves, you know, when it comes to ourselves and the messages that we tell ourselves, we have to think of, well, what, what would I tell a friend? Like if a friend came to me with an issue like this, what would I, what would I say to my friend? I have teenage children myself. I have younger children and I have teenagers. And for me personally, this works, this works well with my kids. Um, you know, self-compassion is important. We want to treat ourselves with the kind, you know, caring support that we would give to someone else. But we also need to think through that lens of, you know, if, if my best friend or my sister or someone came to me with exactly what is bothering me, you know, what, what would I say to them? How would I have compassion for them? How would I have empathy to them? What would be the steps? And sometimes taking it out of yourself, you know, taking the experience and depersonalizing it can really help to open you up. And I think, um, I think validating the feelings that a child might have um, is really crucial. You know, sitting with them, you can you can have an emotion without letting that emotion take over you. 
That's one of the things that I like to tell uh, children when working with them is that you can experience an emotion and not let that emotion take over you. That's part of mindfulness. I think that that's really, really key here. Um, and I think that just also companioning your child through that failure. Also, maybe sometimes it's a wake up call to us as to you know the messages that we're giving across. And maybe sometimes we do, like Dr. Novick said, really need to praise the process more than the final product and fail is, is, is first attempt in learning, right? In order to get to where we need to go, sometimes, yeah, we do mess up and that's okay. Everybody does. And you can talk about your own personal experiences, but having that self-compassion I think is important. Carly, I'm so glad you said the word validating because it occurred to me as you were talking that I, I, I certainly don't mean that the way to deal with a, a teen who thinks they're a failure is say, no, you're not. Yeah. No, oh, you're great. I love you. You're terrific. Um, the first step in parenting is always, always to validate and accept what your child tells you as valid. It doesn't mean you agree with it. It doesn't mean you say, yes, that's absolutely true. You are a failure. Validation is not agreement. Validation is saying, I see that that's how you feel. And that must feel so terrible. Oh, I, I, let's, let's think about that. Let's think about where that feeling's coming from and what would you tell a friend if they had that feeling? But you have to start with, I heard you. I get it. I see that that's how you feel and just accept and validate. You can't go anywhere if you don't do that first. And keeping those lines of communication open are so important because in today's day and age, it's so easy for a child to just have a feeling and go straight to their phone and look for validation by social media, or whatever means they're going to look for validation. And that's really not going to do very much to help them emotionally. In fact, the research suggests that connecting to social media works well if you're happy and positive and you get happy and positive comments, then it boosts your self-esteem. But if you are sad, depressed, lonely, isolated, and you connect to social media, you will get more sad and lonely and isolated responses and it decreases your self-esteem and your mood. Right. Um, I would like to share a question that we received from the audience. The question is, how do we as parents help our teenagers identify emotions? Um, Carly, if you would like to begin. Great question. Um, I think, you know, this reminds me of, you know, when, it, when you're working with a child, let's say, who has a fear of something or who is anxious about something. One of the first things that I would always say is, well, where do you feel what you're feeling, right? And, and if, you feel, if you feel a little icky or if you feel a little uncomfortable, your body's sending you a message that you're feeling something. What is that feeling that you're feeling, right? And I think that sometimes you can start there that really asking them to recognize what their body feels and then that helps to clue them in as to what the emotion is and what the experience of that emotion might be. Um, I think, you know, engaging in dialogue with your child openly, um, being able to talk about how you're feeling is really critical. Otherwise, you know, a child might have an emotion and blunt it and not express it, you know, getting back to the topic of social media, if a child is fully absorbed in social media and not communicating with someone about what they're feeling or, you know, on a daily basis, uh, they may be cut off from what they're feeling. So keeping that line of communication open with your child to be the one that, you know, you, they, you companion them and you are there for them to talk things through is really important. Noticing uh, what your triggers are, like where you feel what you're feeling will really help you identify what the emotion is. Um, I don't know, Dr. Novik, if you have any other ideas here. Sure. Um, first of all, here's a, here's a time when school and home partnership can be really helpful. There are a lot of 
measures of mood and emotions that are used in schools. One of the easiest one is just a, a grid. Um, think of a, a square divided into four squares where you have high, uh, positive and negative and high and low. So high positive is I'm really happy and high negative is I'm really upset. And um, low positive is eh, I'm okay, you know, and I just feel all right. And low negative is I'm a little bummed, but not terrible. And it, it's usually done in a color grid with, you know, going from the spectrum of red to blue, to yellow and green. If it's the kind of thing that your child's school is using, then it's really easy when they come home to say, are, were you in the red today? Were you in the yellow today? Where, where are you? Um, the, the other thing though is, I have sometimes found it helpful to be less direct. Maybe it's having sons. Um, you know, I, I joke that you ask a teenage boy how his day was. Okay. What'd you do? Stuff. How you feeling? Uh, who'd you hang with? Guys. You know, you, you don't get a lot of verbiage with many uh, boys. Um, but with all teenagers, an indirect way to talk about feelings is sometimes to talk about them, and it's, it's sometimes easier for teens to see it in someone else. So where is the someone else? Watch a TV show together. Watch any TV show that teenagers watch. You'll see plenty of emotions, overacted, you know, horribly acted, but that can open a dialogue about how do you think that character on the show is feeling right now? Why do you think that? What signs or cues do we have that, that, how that that's how the character is feeling? What do you think led to those feelings? And then you connect it to your child. Have you ever felt like that character feels? What kinds of things might bring those feelings for you? And back to Carly's question, and when you have those feelings, where do you feel them in your body? Um, for example, I mean, I often ask, you know, adults, if I had, if we were all in the room together, I would ask you, how many people, when you get nervous, feel something in your stomach? How many people, when you get nervous, get kind of heart palpitations or sweaty palms? How many of you feel tension in your neck? That's, that's what it means, how feelings manifest themselves in our bodies in physical ways. And when we learn those physical cues, it can be very helpful both to recognize, oh, I'm tense, look, my shoulders are up here. But it also can be very helpful to say, so I need to do my neck relaxing exercise. And that's gonna get the tension out. And that's gonna help me psychologically, even though I'm working on a physical response. There's a great tool um, called the Mood Meter from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. They make, actually there's an app of it and there's fridge magnets. I have uh, fridge magnets of it hanging on my fridge. So I guess it's a living lab in my house. I don't know. But um, my, you know, people use the Mood Meter for all different ages. They have it in all different forms. But like Dr. Novik was saying, um, we have you know, it's a great way for you to identify all different kinds of emotions. There's also something you can Google called the feelings wheel that you can use. And uh, these are some great tools that, that you can use at home. Thank you. I also just want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A box that will be on the bottom of your screen. Moving on. Um, what are factors to keep in mind and how best to approach explaining bad news or a traumatic personal event to a child or teen? Dr. Novak. Um, you know, one, one wishes we never had to do this. The factors are the child, everything about the child, their age, their proximity to the event, you know, if the bad news is about somebody very close to them versus the bad news is about something happening in the world, that's going to be very different. Um, think about, you know, th this is not something one does before bedtime or before you're putting them on the school bus and sending them off to school. So you have to think about timing also. And then I go back to what are the things that make us resilient is, you know, meaning and purpose, 
having a context and, and understanding and having reassurance. And so making sure that along with the bad news, we include, and I will be here with you. And here's what is going to happen. And here are the things that are not going to change. You know, the typical example is a, a, a child, let's say a middle school child who loses a grandparent. And we may be thinking in our head about all of the questions and issues that are swimming in that child's head when in fact what they're thinking about is what's gonna to happen to buy bat mitzvah? And what's it gonna be like? And are we still gonna have a simcha? And is it gonna be different? And can I still have fun? And uh, again, letting our children know when we have to share bad news, local or global, that any feeling they have is acceptable. There's no wrong feeling that will listen to whatever it is they wanna talk about, that we're here. And, and also to leave the door open that these conversations often, you know, they have to percolate and your child might have a question an hour or a day or a week or a month later and letting them know that you're open to always having those conversations whenever they're ready. I would just add that um, I think the children's coping is tethered to the coping of the adults around them, right? And the modeling that the adults show. So I know I heard this from you, Dr. Novik, and from other people when COVID hit, one of the things that we were really emphasizing was, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first. So if you're going to have, if you have to have a conversation with a child, just make sure that you're in check first. You know, it's normal and okay for a child to see you emotional and for a child to see you upset um, and for a child to see you teary, that's, that's okay. But, you know, if we're going to be, if it's going to just be too uncomfortable for us and we're going to be too emotional, we just want to make sure that we're in check before we do share anything with a child. Um, and really that we ourselves, you know, have, are okay with our thoughts and feelings about whatever we need to share. Like Dr. Novik said, the idea that there's no wrong or right way to, to, um, to handle a situation or to process a situation. And everybody does deal with different emotions differently. You know, like Viktor Frankl said, an abnormal reaction to, uh, what is it? An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we we want to validate whatever the child is feeling. And, that, you know, one of the things that I like to tell children is that our emotions flow through a pipeline. Right. We want to make sure that we allow ourselves to experience all emotions so that we don't create a block. And that way we are really able to deal with the situation in a way that we need to deal with it. And, you know, different children of different ages need different kinds of explanations and reassurance, and they're going to question, you know, differently. Um, a very young child or an elementary school age child might not understand when we say that something is rare and, and doesn't happen very often, whereas, you know, a middle schooler or a high schooler will understand that. A high schooler will, you know, may ask the questions, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And they may question and, and just be us being there and being that companioning adult for them is really, really helpful. And making sure that there's that opening so that the child will be able to come to you with any questions or just for you to just be there with them is important. Adding on to what you said, we have a question from the audience. Um, sometimes as parents, it's hard to hear that boss mitzvah question. How do we check our own emotions? And if we mess up and react angrily, how do we walk it back? So first of all, you know, thank you, parent, for being human um, and, and for being open and honest. We have all made mistakes as parents. We have all said things that we wish we could have said differently. As Carly reminded us, you know, if we could anticipate or think when we go into this kind of situation, I'm not gonna lose it, whatever my child says, whatever, you know, they're, they're coming from 
whatever there is, is foremost in their mind. And I'm Don Lakofskut, you know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. However, it will happen that we make mistakes. And I think that one of the greatest lessons and get, we teach our children and gifts we give them is when we ask their forgiveness and when we apologize and when we admit that we too make mistakes. And so saying, you know, I, I was caught off guard. I was so sad about grandma and I, I wasn't really thinking about what it felt like for you and thinking about your bat mitzvah party, which I know is so important to you. And I know you loved grandma and I know you don't mean anything um, negative about it or that you don't mean to say it's not important, this loss. So I'm sorry that you know, I was short with you or that I lost my temper. Um, I, I think that that's what we, what we have to do. And I think it's, a, again, a great teachable moment to say, e even to reveal your own emotionality, to say, you caught me at a time when I was very, very emotional and I didn't handle it so well. And that happens sometimes. Yeah. Giving yourself permission to to feel and and saying that even using those words with your child mm -hmm. are so important I think also we have to you know as emotional as we might be about a situation we have to try to remember you know step into their world for a minute and you know sometimes it's really hard because we're overcome by our own emotion but when you step into an 11 year old's world the, their bat mitzvah might be the be all and end all for them and the build up of of everything for them up until that point so I think it can be helpful to just step outside of ourselves for a bit and step into their shoes and, and say, wow, as an 11 year old, like this is my world. Thank you. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that we'll be wrapping up shortly. We have a few more questions and to please submit questions to the question box if there's anything specific you'd like to ask. Um, the next question is, how does early stress or trauma affect resilience in children or teens? What are some protective factors that can help promote resilience despite early stress or trauma? Carly, would you like to start us off? Sure. So I think, um, you know, trauma can really, it can wreak havoc for a child. Um, there are some protective factors that individuals can have as well, um, but it can affect the way that we learn. It can affect the way that we feel. It can affect, affect the relationships that we have with other people, the way that we interact with others, the way that others interact with us. Um, and it really, trauma can be, you know, if left unattended, it's, it's almost like it's an open wound and it can deepen and it can intensify if left unattended. Um, I've joined uh, OHEL recently, and we've just launched a national trauma center. And my role specifically within the trauma center is to work with schools and organizations on developing trauma sensitivity. So we are currently putting together um, a package that we will be able to bring to schools and organizations to help, you know, bring trauma informed education and resilience boosting practices to schools so that you know we are all aligned in our understanding of how trauma can affect students and and other individuals within our settings and what we can do to be inclusive and to be sensitive to others um, there's there are children that despite their adverse experiences though can really demonstrate incredible resilience um, and really, really remarkable. And I, we talk about adverse childhood experiences, right? The ACEs, but there's also this idea of uh, positive childhood experiences. There's a great new book that just came out, came out called The Resilience Workbook. It's by Dr. Karen Baruch Feldman and there's another author as well. It just, just came out. And uh, the workbook is really remarkable. I highly recommend it to, to everyone. And it talks about this idea of these positive childhood experiences that children who did endure adversity, um, if that was countered by the ability to have a championing adult, you know, have an adult that's there for them, that believes in them, if they had the ability to talk with someone about their feelings, if they had the ability to feel 
that their family or there are other people around them that are supportive during their difficulties. They were still able to thrive. Um, being engaged within a community, um, that's why it's so important to have that trauma sensitivity in an organization that can really boost a child's resilience. The feeling of belonging in school is really crucial to a child's resilience. The fact that a child knows that there are dependable adults that are there for them and that they have a sense of place and belonging in school is something that can really go a long way to promote their resilience. Um, having those social connections as well can really boost your child's resilience and feeling safe and feeling protected is something that can really help them as well. But I, I think when we talk about trauma-informed care, some of the things we talk about it is a, a real sense of psychological and physical safety, um, a sense of connection that's really, really important. And if a child is really able to learn to, to identify their emotions, to be aware of their emotions and to manage their emotions, it can really go a long way to build resilience. The, the reality is the research suggests that it's not all bad and that there actually are some what are called stealing effects of early exposure or earlier exposure to stress. We're kind of using the word trauma, stress, um, it, it, almost interchangeably. There is no um, one clear definition of what trauma is. And part of the issue is that we used to think trauma was a big event. We then thought trauma was ongoing big events, but research has told us that exposure on a regular basis to even moderate stress, like poverty, is traumatic. It doesn't have to be, you know, God forbid a child had cancer or God forbid was in a car accident. The trauma might be um, living with uh, a, an impoverished family um, over a long period of time. The stealing effects that I wanted to talk about, the, there are two studies. One looked at um, what are the soldiers called who jump out of parachute, jump out of airplanes the, those paratroopers. paratroopers, thank you, paratroopers. So when you study paratroopers on their first flight and their first parachute jump, they're, all of their nervous system responses show very high levels of anxiety. But when you get to their third, fourth, fifth, sixth jump, they no longer show those high levels of anxiety as if the earlier stress and trauma of jumping out of an airplane, which you would never catch me doing, actually steals them, strengthens them, hardens them for doing it later on. A study more relevant to us was done of children who had early hospitalizations for fairly normative reasons. They were having tubes, ear tubes put in or a hernia operation, but they had, uh, children had um, uh, hospitalization. If children had an earlier separation from their parents that was fairly normative, like their parents went overnight to a wedding or the parents had a business trip and they had to stay with grandma, grandpa, or someone else, early separation steeled them for the hospitalization and they did better. So the early kind of trauma or stress of being separated from parents actually made them stronger. Um, and, and we have some of this notion in popular thought, you know, what doesn't kill, it, kill me makes me stronger. Of course, we do not want to go and throw stress at our children. But for those of us who know that there has been stress and or um, unfortunately trauma or tragedy in our children's lives, we do not need to feel that this is going to forever scar them. Children are remarkably resilient, especially when, as Carly said, they get the help going through those stressors that they need. Yeah, I think a question came in about some of the books that I mentioned. I did actually have this one handy. I don't know if you see it back to front or through my, my screen. 
No, it's not. Uh, it's not showing. It's called the Resilience Workbook for Kids: Thirty-Two Skills to Build I Can Do It Muscles by Dr. Karen Baruch Feldman and Rebecca Comizio. Um, it just came out and it has a companion. Uh, if you sign on to their website, it has a companion guide for parents and it also has a companion guide for educators. And it's really, really wonderful. Uh, we do also on OHEL's website, you can download the resilience workbook that was made specifically for COVID, but it's going to be adjusted um, for post COVID. I also read uh, the question was about uh, some books or some resources to read. I read, I recently read a book by Sherry Mandel called The Road to Resilience. It's a really remarkable book. Um, it was written uh, a number of years ago and she writes about her son, Kobe was, was killed uh, by a terrorist in Israel. And she wrote, she writes about her experience and the road to resilience. And it's really a beautiful, wonderful book. Um, there are some other books I could recommend. There's a book called Thrivers by Michelle Borba that came out. It actually came out, I think, uh, did it come out this year or perhaps it, I think it came out more recently. It's a wonderful, wonderful book and it's all about um, resilience. There's another book that came out called The, uh, the Scaffold Effect by the finder of the Child Mind Institute. And it's really, really wonderful as well. And there are some great podcasts out there also. Dr. Lisa Damour has a wonderful po podcast um, that really speaks a lot about resilience. And there's, there's so much stuff out there. It's, it's hard to keep up. Thank you. Um, we also have another question from the audience. Would you consider to divorce to be a traumatic event for children? And what can we do for these children? Dr. Novick. So any kind of family change can be traumatic for children, but being in a, in, in a family where there's either physical or verbal abuse or two very unhappy parents may be just as traumatic as having your parents separate. There are many things that we can do to make divorce and the, its impacts less negative for children. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, developing, which is very hard to do, a good working relationship between the ex-spouses and custody and living arrangements that are the least disruptive in a child's life. And that put the child's needs first. Avoiding putting the child in the middle and asking them questions like, well, who do you really like better? Or who do you want to live with? Um, you know, and not making them... Um, and an agent to fuel the, uh, the, the fires of um, dissension in the family. Um, but many children, again, divorce is a very common event in the lives of today's children and children survive it. Is it, you know, it, it's no more ideal than, you know, having a broken leg or getting stitches. I'm not comparing them. Those are those are um, transient events. But the point is that if if after you have a broken leg, your parents mollycoddle you, are overly protective, never let you play another sport, watch you like a hawk and infantilize you, then that becomes a lifelong traumatic event with with you know repercussions. It's not the divorce alone that is problematic. It's what happens before and after it. And to the extent that the grown-ups in the picture can really put the child's needs front and center, we can ameliorate the, the impact of the trauma. I think we can look at, you know, any trauma, there's the, there's the three E's of trauma. There's the event itself, what actually happened. There's the experience of the event, right? So the same thing can happen, but somebody like Dr. Novick and somebody like me can experience that same event differently. Um, and then there's the effect of that event. You know, how is that felt by, you know, what, what is the lasting impact of that on somebody like me? Um, as opposed to somebody else. And it's so subjective, you know, and we, we talk about trauma today, there's many ways that a person can experience trauma, whether it's, you know, loss of a job, loss of an income, 
Um, you know, there are many, many different ways that a person can experience trauma today. And since COVID, that has just really widened. Thank you. Um, I would like to share another question from the audience. Can you speak briefly about available treatments and therapies for trauma in children with anger? Carly? There's many different uh, forms of treatment available um, at the moment. There's, you know, there's EMDR, there's DBT, there's all different kinds of treatment. Um, you know, a person that is experiencing a trauma um, it's, it's a wonderful thing that there are supports available within the community, within schools for individuals um, to be able to access the support that they need. I think there's the individual treatment. And I think that something else that, you know, the trauma team is really trying to really push ahead with is this idea of having a support group and having other people that you can go through this experience with um, and other people that you can relate to. We have a trauma team that is available to respond to traumas as they happen, but we also have a, a network of support that we're building for other people. We have a range of support groups that people can attend um, to get support for whatever they are going through. Um, there's different kinds of treatment for trauma, depending on the age, depending on, you know, the particular trauma that the person has gone through. But I do think also having the right support group and network available is something that can really, really help. Getting back to the question before about divorce, uh, there is a more of a pull now in schools to have something called banana splits groups, right? Where we take the experience of children who are coming from divorced homes and we have groups in school that the children can attend, you know, with different age groups that uh, where they can experience support from kids in their school that are going through the same thing. So they're really, it, it really depends on the kind of trauma that a person is experiencing, but there are a range of different therapies and treatments that are out there. But we, you want to make sure that whatever treatment you're seeking and you're receiving is from a licensed mental health professional. Um, there are many kinds of treatments out there and you do really want to make sure that the treatment that you're receiving is appropriate to what you're going through. I would say along those lines that most of the research evidence suggests that treatments, as Carly is discussing them, tend to be supportive or cognitive behavioral in nature, not psychodynamic. No one is suggesting psychodynamic play therapy for years and years for children who are experiencing trauma or have experienced trauma, and that the most appropriate and, and successful treatments for things like anxiety and depression have generally been found to be in the cognitive behavioral realm. That being said, work with children and teens and all psychotherapeutic work needs a good working relationship between a patient and therapist. And so you sometimes have to try more than one person and more than one support group until you find the one that clicks for your teen or your child. And I would not rule out the need for children who are showing severe impact of trauma, I would not rule out an evaluation for whether or not medications might be of help. Um, I think it is so unfortunate that we think of medications to deal with emotions and our emotional well being any differently than we think of medications to deal with our physical health. We would never tell an asthmatic to just breathe. Just open up those, those lung pathways and breathe better. We would never tell a diabetic child, just make some insulin. We would provide the medical treatment that will give them what their body is missing. We know that in some cases, anxiety and depression um, have um, neurologic impairments that can be corrected, not just with therapy, but in some cases with medication as well. Thank you. I would like to ask our last question of the evening. And if you can also share any closing remarks as you answer this question, what are some ways to teach, foster, or model empathy? Carly? So I think, 
you know, going back to my time in schools, there was a Harvard had a really, really great initiative called Making Caring Common. And it was an initiative to really drive home empathy in schools and really uh, work with children to really build empathy. Um, and I think one of the first things we need to remember is that it starts, it starts at home, right? You want to model that empathy one-on-one -on -one with your child in how you talk to them, how you attend to what they're feeling, um, what you bring up with them. I remember also teaching a lot, you know, you can access this. It's a wonderful tool for educators. They have a website called Making, I can't remember exactly, but if you Google Harvard Graduate School of Education, Making Caring Common, you should be able to find, there's a number of interventions you can try. Um, but the message is really that empathy starts at home and children notice who and how we validate children notice also we need to make sure that we're making kindness and reaching out to others a, a value that we model and we we really talk about a lot in the home you know we I remember teaching about the idea of what we call a circle of concern right it's very easy for us to have empathy for people who are like us who we know who are familiar to us and one of the things that we can do is really help to expand a child's circle of concern and help a child think beyond themselves, beyond their immediate circle, to look at, you know, how might this, whatever it is that we're going through, impact somebody else? What might another person be thinking or feeling? And really help them notice and build that awareness of others and the care and concern to think about their perspectives and how they might interpret things. And I think, you know, when we're talking about children, sometimes, you know, it's, it's not a child has empathy or doesn't have empathy. You know, sometimes we need to think of, well, what might be blocking that person's capacity to have, to show empathy, right? I think by nature, maybe I'm being too optimistic, but I think by nature, we all have that care and concern within us. I think sometimes there are just other things going on that might block us from being able to really demonstrate and live that empathy for others. And sometimes getting to the bottom of what might that block be? You know, is a child struggling with regulating their own emotions that they can't look beyond what they're feeling? And sometimes, you know, working with the child to, to learn to you know, regulate their own emotions so that they have space for others and to look beyond themselves can be a really, really helpful tool. Um, but uh, empathy is really a wonderful, wonderful quality to teach. We can teach it from a young age. We can use stories. We can, when we teach literature, when we teach homage and Navi, we can teach, you know, the idea of what might this person be thinking and feeling? And really it is such a wonderful key to broaden a child's mind and experience and how they see the world. You know, the funny thing about empathy is that it's hardest when we most need it. You know, at the moment that a child is fighting with their sibling or is calling you a name, that's when you want them to feel your pain and understand the impact they're having on others but that's the, the worst time to teach it. The best time to teach empathy are in calm moments and sometimes in very indirect ways. Um, I, I have the privilege of visiting lots of classrooms and I visited a classroom once where I saw a teacher actually put Xerox of footprints on the floor. And as they were reading Tom Sawyer, she would say, would you stand in Tom's footprints? And right now, Aunt Polly has told you, you have to paint the whole fence. How is Tom feeling? You're standing in Tom's shoes. You're in Tom's shoes. How does this situation look to you? And that's what we need to do with our children. We need to ask them to stand in somebody else's shoes. And it again is easier indirectly. It's easy when you're watching a, a movie or reading a book together, or you have a news story that you've just heard about and say, Let's think for a moment, how would we feel if that were happening to us? What do you think that would be like? And that's the opportunity for building empathy muscles and getting us used to it. You're right, Carly, we, it's not optimistic. The research says we are born empathic. 
we are actually, most species are um, born that way. If you wanna see an amazing discussion, very brief and succinct, and maybe even watch it with your children, there's a video, you can see it on YouTube by Brene, Brene yeah. on the difference between empathy and sympathy. Yep. And it's absolutely marvelous. I and always I, used it to teach. I know, yeah. I know. We, we have to close in a minute. I, I just wanna close with this thought. When I think of resilience, I think about the trees we have here in the Northeast, our oaks and our elms and our maples, sturdy and strong, right? Until a storm comes. And then their limbs snap off. They topple, sometimes taking whole balls of earth with them. And then I think about trees in the tropics and in Israel. And when a storm comes, they bend. They're fluid and they're flexible. One of the things about parenting is we can't be rigid. We need to change with the times and with the stormy weather that comes. And a gift that we give our children is to teach them to be flexible too, so that they bend and not break, no matter how strong the wind gets. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Novak and Carly for joining us and sharing your insights. Right now you'll see on the screen, um, the post survey, if you can all please fill that out, this will also be sent to your email. There will be a recording of this webinar. It will be posted to the JOMA YouTube channel. And I encourage you all to subscribe so you can see all of JOMA's great educational content. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Good night, everybody. Good night.